Hi, this is Ron Sipsik, and this is the first part of a four-part series on labor market theory. In this particular segment, we're going to introduce you to uh, some very basic principles about labor markets. And one of the most interesting uh, things that we can learn about labor market theory is you can take market theory on the product side and you can apply it to labor markets. In other words, there are markets for labor. And so I want to, in this first lesson, show you where, uh, where labor market, uh, the theory where labor markets originate from. Okay, and we're going to start today with a simple circular flow model. This is a model we often use in macroeconomics to look at the entire economy. We see here we have a business sector and we have a household sector. Now I'm assuming this is a market system or a capitalistic system, so I'm leaving government out of it. Uh, I'm basically talking about the business sector and the household sector. And we know that markets have both sellers and buyers. So the business is going to be the seller, the seller of what? Of products, goods, goods and services are going to flow from the business sector to the household sector. So households actually are buyers of goods and services. Businesses, as you know, are sellers of goods and services. Now, in return, what do households supply businesses with? Well, households supply businesses with resources. In a market system, resources are actually privately owned. So, for instance, labor. You own your labor. You have the right to sell it with, with, within certain limits. Uh, you can sell your labor to businesses, and you get to choose how you want to sell your labor. So, for instance, if you want to work in a restaurant, and you want to wait tables while you're going to school, you can do that. You can offer your labor for sale. So actually, you're, you are the seller of a resource called uh, of a resource called labor. So resources, I'll just put that on this arrow here, resources flow from right to left. An example of resources would be labor. Households are the sellers of their own labor. Who buys that labor? Well, businesses are the buyers of this labor. So we can see then that fundamental market theory where you have sellers and buyers applies to both the product side, goods and services, and it applies to the resource side. In this case, we're, we're talking about labor. Now remember there are other types of resources. There's not only labor, but there's land, natural resources, there's capital. Capital is human-made resources, things like machinery, buildings, that sort of thing, vehicles. And there's also entrepreneurship, which is the contribution of the, the, the owner uh, to the process. Now, what I've done up here is I've drawn a product market space. Uh, how do goods and services flow from the business sector to the household sector? They flow through markets. So we have a supply curve uh, for goods and services, and we have a demand curve for goods and services. And we've already learned in earlier lessons that there is a price for output and there is a quantity measure for output. So at the intersection of supply and demand you have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. The seller in the product side on the product side is the business and the demander on the product side is the household member. Okay. So that's important to remember. And most of the principles of microeconomics course is going to be devoted to the product side. This is very, very common that you spend much of your course looking at the product side, how goods and services flow from businesses to households. You look at purely competitive markets. You look at monopolized markets. You look at monopolistically competitive markets. You look at uh, markets that are characterized as oligopolistic. These are all channels through which goods and services flow from the business sector to the household sector. So most of your course, most of the principles of microeconomics course is going to be devoted to the product side. But we can take market theory and economic, and economic principles and we can apply them to the resource side. So there is a supply curve for labor. Who is the supplier of labor? It's going to be households. And there's a demand for labor, 
who is going to be the demander of labor. In this case, it's going to be businesses. If government were in the picture, uh, we've left government out of the picture, but government could also be a, a demander for labor. And then there's a price of labor. We're going to use a P here. Uh, in the case of a labor market, we'd actually use a W. Okay, I'm going to generalize and use the standard case or the broad case of a price of labor, but the price of labor is a wage. And then there's going to be a quantity of labor down here, a quantity of the resource traded, and in a labor market setting, that would actually be an employment level. All right, so we see that supply and demand theory apply to both the product side and to the resource side. Our focus in this particular series will be on labor. Okay? Now let me just, as long as I have this model up, let me, um, let me just add a few more things. Uh, maybe tie this in uh, to the, the, the broader picture, the macro picture. So goods and services flow from the business sector to the household sector Households make what? Households make expenditures. So this flow up here is actually a dollar value. Total in the United States would be dollars. Total dollar expenditures. So expenditures are made uh, for these goods and services. How do you calculate expenditures? Well, that's going to be the price of the product times the quantity of the product sold. So if you take the price of the product times the quantity, uh, you get the total expenditure on the product. But what do expenditures become when they flow into the business sector? When they flow into the business sector, they're not called expenditures, they're actually called total revenue. So this is total dollar revenue, total dollar revenue. And again, to calculate total revenue, we've, we've shown this in earlier lessons, uh, it's price times quantity. So we see, we see somewhat of an identity here. There's an identity. In the simple circular flow model, household expenditures have to equal business revenues. This is an identity. It has to be true because in the simple circular flow, we assume no leakages from the, from the circular flow. Now, what do businesses do with these revenues? Well, they have to turn around and they have to pay for these resources. So this is going to be total dollar resource payments. And so let me just, um, let me expand this a little bit. And these could be, there's four basic types of resources. So you have land, and the payment on land is called what? Rent. You have uh, labor, and the payment for labor is called what? Wages and you have capital and the payment for capital is called interest and we have something called entrepreneurship which is the creative risk-taking genius of the owner if the owner isn't a risk-taking creative genius uh, the owner will probably not be owning a business for long it will probably go out of business and what's the return to the entrepreneur the re entrepreneur gets something called profit so if you take rent wages interest and profit and you add those all together these are your resource payments and again we've learned this earlier in the course we should know this already. So businesses make these resource payments. How do you get how do you get the resource payment? Well, again, it's it's going to be price of the resource times the quantity of the resource. So if this is a wage rate, it would be W. If this is an employment level, it would be an L. I'll actually be showing that later in our series. But wage rate times employment level, or the price of labor times the quantity of labor, will give you the total resource payment. And that flows over here and becomes uh, income. So this is total dollar income. So businesses call it resource payments. Households call it income. Okay. And again, how do you calculate total income? You take the price of the resource times the quantity of the resource uh, to get the income number. All right. So this is the simple circular flow model. 
and it's a nice way of introducing uh, the idea that market theory applies not only to goods and services, but it applies to resource markets. Now, what I'd like to do, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to drag this lesson out very long. I'm going to wrap this lesson up. This is a series of four, four lessons. But I want to focus a little bit on this. We're actually going to be developing the foundations behind this demand curve and this supply curve. But let's, let's go ahead and move down. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to just elaborate a little bit more on this on this model so let's go to black so what we're going to prove to you over the next several lessons is we're going to show you where a labor market comes from we're going to show you the foundations beneath the supply curve and the demand curve and so here's our supply curve here's our demand curve and this is supply. Remember again, in a labor market, we're talking about a labor market. Who will be the supplier of labor? Well, that will be members of households. So workers, workers um, supply labor. And then who will be the demander of, of labor? It'll be the business sector primarily. Now we're leaving government out of this. It could be government as well, but we're going to leave government out of this right now. So we've got an equilibrium price for labor. We're going to now call this a wage. So we'll call this WE. And we've got an equilibrium quantity of labor. We're going to call this L sub E. L is an employment level. So let's go ahead and move that up. So what is W? W is the wage rate. And this could be an hourly wage rate. The wage rate is the price of labor. And L, L is the quantity of labor. And it's really an employment level. Okay, it's an employment level. So you'll see this as we move forward. We'll be using W's and L's. It's standard notation in labor market theory. Uh, sometimes uh, in more advanced courses, you'll use P and Q here because you just use a more standard presentation. But, but we will use W and L. And in all of the principles of labor market theory that we just, or excuse me, all of the principles of market theory that we discussed earlier with respect to goods and services apply here. If the if the wage rate is too low, you'll see there will be a, a shortage of labor. And if the wage rate is too high, there will be a surplus of labor. And, and so what we'll be showing later in the lesson is that wages tend to move towards equilibrium. So where does, where does the labor market tend to operate? It operates where supply equals demand. So if the wage rate is too high, the wage rate is too high, it will tend to drop towards equilibrium. If the wage rate is too low, the wage rate is too low, there will be what? A shortage of labor and the wage will tend to push up towards equilibrium. So we'll be discussing that uh, as, we, as we go further into this. All right, this concludes our first le lesson on labor market theory. In the, uh, in the next lesson, we're going to look at where the supply curve for labor and specifically the demand curve for labor come from. We're going to discuss the foundations.